Good afternoon. Um, so I'm going to discuss the use of drone technology in ocean research um, in the Saco River estuary. That's in, located right at, outside where our university is. Um, as you may be aware of, the Gulf of Maine is going through some pretty radical changes lately. Um, somebody mentioned lobsters moving north. Well, the cod are actually moving north from the Gulf of Maine, and so a lot of these uh, cod and haddock and valuable fishing species are um, moving north. Um, <clears throat> they we're having certain algae blooms that uh, um, are causing shellfish uh, recalls. We're having uh, problems with clams and many of the fisheries in the Gulf of Maine. Um, so this is a story map. And hopefully, there we go. This map is to give you an idea of the Saco River and how students use that as part of their research. Um, <clears throat> the Saco River um, goes from New Hampshire and flows all the way down through Bitterford and Saco into the ocean. And the University of of New England sits right on that uh, barrier or area between the ocean and where the Saco River flows in. So it's been um, mapped for a very long time. In fact, 1605 was the first map done in this area. So it has a long history. There are currently dredging projects going on in the Saco. Um, they're doing uh, or planning on trying to do a, um, a beach erosion um, mediation, which involves 400,000 cubic yards, which is uh, a lot of sand. <laughs> so <clears throat> this project has been in debate for uh, think about 20 years now. Um, and so there's a couple of people that are upset that 12 trucks an hour will be going by their house full of sand <laughs> for three months solid. Um, there's also issues with Camp Ellis. Uh, Camp Ellis is where the beach erosion is. Um, and so these are kind of storm surge maps. And that area is highly affected by storm surge. Um, the discussion here also is about a lot of uh, um, marsh area. So these are uh, marsh areas that are located along the Salco River estuary. Uh, they have invasive species like Phragmites. I'm not sure if uh, you're familiar with Phragmites, but a lot of marshes have that as an issue. Coastal squeeze is another marsh issue where um, the thought was that as uh, sea levels rose, the marshes would move inland. Well, somebody built a house in the way, uh, or a road, or a bridge, or something like that. Um, this is Phragmites, an invasive uh, that is in a lot of marshes. Um, there's also sewer river, uh, treatment plants. Um, of course, they have to deal with runoff issues. Uh, access to the river is uh, an interesting issue. They have a salmon uh, hatchery there too, so they are trying to restore Atlantic salmon to the Saco River area. Dams and impasses are issues. So all of these make the Saco River estuary a nice area for research, okay? So it's, it's, it's a microcosm of a lot of problems that you'll see on the coast any place in the Carolinas, in Maine, or any place like that. Um, I actually work in the maker space. We do project-based education. It's student-centered. We talk about career intelligence, so we ask them, okay, when you get out of school, what do you want for a job? Have you looked at several resumes? One of the important things they find out is it's good to know how to make a map. 
it's really good to know how to make a map, an ESRI map, because that helps you to get employment. Um, we work on the latest technology, so we use uh, drone and mapping technology. We try to be open source as much as possible because it supports a lot of our ocean science work, environmental work, and citizen science, right? So a lot of environmental groups want to do things inexpensively. Well, you can do that with drone technology, and I'll show you a few examples of that. Oh, sorry. Um, we have several customers for the makerspace. So we have innovation stuff. So we do everything from neuroscience to marine science to biology. Uh, um, we also have a makerspace club. So they do fun things. We have a sewing night. We'll do, that was our Halloween night. We laser cut shadow boxes. We do class projects. So this wasn't a pirate. This was actually an example they were using in a medical class. Uh, and we do student research. This is a tanning booth for fruit flies. So they do pain research, and so uh, that's an Arduino-controlled type of system. Um, when we work with a student on a project, they'll have different things that they want to do. So we go through uh, uh, an initial meeting. So we kind of use, is anybody familiar with Agile at all? It's a rapid base kind of system where you do like a minimum viable product in a very short period of time. And so we'll talk to them about the project, getting people involved in the project. We'll train them, so we'll teach them soldering, 3D printing, laser cutting, Arduino, Raspberry Pi, all of that stuff. Um, and um, so we'll do quick training sessions, and we do many of them. Um, which translates to some of these projects, right? In this case, it was a, a sea level rise, um, and so they did a lot of ArcGIS work in sea level rise, and um, what we have is a very high focus on student undergraduate research. So we have a fall symposium, which covers the student undergraduate research experience, which is over the summer, they'll work on a project. Um, and they also have one in the spring, which a lot of classes will make use of, saying, okay, at the end of uh, your research or your classwork, present your material. And this is an example of a spring-based um, project. Um, so, we build a lot of stuff in the Makerspace. We build the MIT Sea Perch. Um, that's a drone, uh, not a drone, an ROV in a box. This is an open ROV, and this is a Blue Robotics ROV, and she's very happy the software actually worked, uh, which is a very short-term experience, actually. Oh, also, one of our students, we have an innovation challenge uh, where students can get an award for um, um, starting a business, and one of our students actually won and started a business building their own underwater vehicles. Um, and they've got their first round of funding, and uh, they're actually now working out of a makerspace in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which has 4,000, I mean 40,000 square feet, which is very large for this type of, but it's an innovation center makerspace type of deal, and they're moving very well towards their goal, I believe, early spring for uh, this product release. Um, so, whatever project you're doing can require all sorts of different software, and the students will learn many of these tools. So, one, two, three, design, if you want to design your own 3D product. Um, <coughs> Cure is an example of how you talk to a 3D printer, we have Python code, they do schematic capture, they can do board layout if they need to. Um, now this is, I'm going to have a couple of examples here of students actually working on projects. Um, so in the summer, um, Ariella needed to do a project associated with uh, green crabs, 
Green crabs are an invasive that are a big problem in the state of Maine. They like to eat clams and, um, and all sorts of um, items in the marsh area type of deal. So we, this project was done in a month, right? Basically, she put together an RC um, boat, right? And uh, that boat actually has a plankton sampler on the bottom, which has an ROV motor, which is actually from a drone. So uh, Blue Robotics uses drone technology in their ROVs. Um, and that pulls in water, and um, in the uh, last year, the, uh, somebody donated an island to the university. So that island is in the background there. Um, and uh, this is the plankton sa sampler, and she's running it from a RC system. Now, all of our projects tend to have iterations, right? So the next iteration might be a, um, a semi-autonomous boat. And that boat would use GPS and uh, um, a LoRa radio system, which is a way of getting longer distance communication. Um, we actually built one of the Blue Robotics from a kit. Those students were trained on individual ones, also trained on software like Q Ground Control or um, um, <coughs> Blue Robotics there. They use a Raspberry Pi and a Pickhawk, so they needed to understand how those work together. Um, so um, again, they're starting with the actual kit, which is a lot of pieces, right? They assume it takes six hours to assemble. It does not. <laughs> it takes many more hours to assemble that. Um, but uh, there's a, when you do project-based learning, students are really engaged, and they really enjoy the work. So, uh, and when it works, they're extremely happy about it. Um, so this is uh, Lauren, and she's trying it on the boat. One of the other things we do with students, though, is we ask them to pay it forward and teach other students. We only have two people that actually work in the makerspace. Um, Anthony, who does the innovation and business, and um, myself, I do more of the technical stuff. So uh, a lot of times, students will be training other students in the makerspace. And Lauren is training, uh, um, let's see, one person's gonna do a LG sensor, another, uh, I believe, is doing a add-on that creates a claw, and they're also looking at a sonar system for distance measurement. Um, spatial planning. So for the ROV, um, we needed to look at the dredging area, which is one of those areas right there, um, and also where they're putting the dredge material, which unfortunately is right outside the island that somebody just gave us. Uh, so we have pictures before, and in probably December we'll have pictures after. I believe it's like 170 thousand cubic yards of material that they're going to dump and so um, that might have a, a, a significant effect on the local area. So these are the pictures and these are the areas where they actually took um, um, pictures from. So this is kind of supposed to be sandy sediment but the seems to be a lot of rocks in the sandy sediment. So um, <clears throat> that may, uh, originally, I think I mentioned Camp Ellis. They were going to dump this stuff on the beach in Camp Ellis. Well, that could cause a problem with that many rocks and stuff like that. So they do have several dump sites. OK, so um, we build boats, underwater vehicles, and also drifters. And this is an example of a basic drifter that a student built using an Arduino system, some Home Depot parts, and a GPS and a data logger system. Um, we do an iterative process, so if you're doing Agile, you'll do like a minimum viable product, and then you'll keep adding on and improve your product, right? 
So the first one is uh, she uh, added a 5-5 timer blinking system so boats could see it. Um, and so uh, she's reading one of my favorite books, Timers, Op Amps, and Optoelectronics, um, to do the, the circuit for that. So that's an example of prototyping. Um, and uh, she's also testing the circuit. The next phase was to do a drone strobe light, so using like the strobe lights for drones. And um, unfortunately, people like to acquire stuff that they see floating in the ocean. Uh, so she's had to, <laughs> we need, now need to go to a low ra radio system with a mapping app so we can see where they are all the time. And if somebody starts moving them, then we can uh, take their picture and at least find out where I, our drifter went. And this is an example of her research paper. Um, she actually, and then you can see the Arduino GPS system right there. She used a lot of MathCAD for analysis. Um, and um, that's the area. So this is kind of a local drifter. If you've worked with drifters, sometimes they do them local, sometimes they do a medium difference, and sometimes they cross the Atlantic Ocean. Um, this is an example of one that actually was used to drift down the Atlantic coast. And um, when they move it into um, ArcGIS, right? So the first thing was you get the longitude latitude data, which is recorded with the drifter. In this case, they used a low orbiting satellite system to communicate the data back. Um, then we ran a program, so they worked with the Python code that actually gave them um, distance and angle. And so then they could compare it to, to, to a web-based system, not web-based, um, wind and other weather systems. And, uh, Used, did some work on symbology, but again, this is an, a continuous process, so we'd like to integrate some of these code into ArcGIS. Um, so this is a, a project that we started last month, uh, and actually we're working right now on the POTS list, right? So uh, these are POTS that we'll probably order for this, and this is a way of uh, using drone technology and drone to map to actually map a 3D coral reef. Um, there's a couple of things that are important about this is camera angle, um, location. Now, so since it's a minimum viable product, right, this is gonna be student powered, right? The student will be swimming behind it. The next step is to actually add a uh, uh, motor system like the other one, and then an autonomous system that uses, you just put in the waypoints and it, it does the um, camera type of stuff. Um, so these are many of the students that actually work on the marine science stuff. We work with many professors, um, and the student undergraduate research is, is research that's funded by various different groups, and uh, um, we really encourage students. So we're looking for students to actually get involved in this. Um, many times when you do uh, GIS stuff, it's what they call cookbook. We give them real problems, and then they use GIS as part of the project. Um, and any questions? That was my time. Yeah, we're ahead of time. Hmm? You've got lots of time. Oh, I do. <laughs> sure. So I was thinking about integrating like the open all of these and not quite as familiar with the uh Well, our process has typically been to start with something simple like a sea perch and then move to uh, um, a blue robotics is trickier than an open ROV. 
But a blue robotics has some really interesting technology. So it can stay in one place. It has six thrusters, right? And a lot of the current ROVs can't do that. Um, the problem with that is the more complex you get, the less of a learning experience. So um, we're sort of working on um, building our own ROV so that they learn how to do, use the uh, electronic controls, which are RC-based controls, so they learn the basic parts of uh, um, pulse width modulation and how you know the remote control truck works type of deal. So right now there's not really a good solution because the sea perch is too basic. The Blue Robotics, has anybody ever used Q ground control? It's a very complex system. Um, so I guess I would look at open ROV, um, but you might not be happy with the learning experience. So that's kind of why we like to teach them how to program Raspberry Pis in Python, because they learn more about um, longitude, latitude, how uh, to do the geometry for figuring out distance and stuff like that. So it, part of it depends on your goal. If your goal is to actually learn about the ocean, then um, go with a kit. Um, the open ROV is very small. So in the area we work in, it doesn't um, have the power really to be under control. So that's another issue you have to deal with. Does that answer your question? Or? Oh, okay. So I saw that you were using um, the smaller, like, build-it-yourself model for the open ROV. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware that there's a newer model coming out, so I was curious how, what your experience has been with the current open ROV model and if you're planning on upgrading to the newer one. Um, so, well, first of all, we do have a student that's starting a new company that's building ROVs, right? So that's an area to look into also, <laughs> right? So um, right now, it's unclear when they'll release the new open ROV model. We can already see some of the same issues that we have with other ROVs with that. And so it has its target market, and we might not be perfect for that. I don't know if that explains it well, but um, it's a really nice ROV. It goes really fast as far as I can tell, right? But I think they were gonna release it in the spring. It's been delayed for a while. So, um, did that answer your question? So I didn't really give you a good answer. <laughs> um, your mileage may vary. <laughs> so, uh, any other questions? How many people uh, actually use ROVs? Um, one of the other things that we're looking at for research is doing some multispectral analysis of coral systems. And so we're kind of interested in fluorescence in corals and uh, PAM fluorescence. Has anybody done any of that kind of research? Well, I guess that's it.